sport, of course, and sport as culture, uh, sport as a global culture, global expressions or national expressions, what makes us similar in terms of sport, and what makes us different in terms of sports. Um, and we might talk about culture in two, two different ways. Either, uh, what, what do you think when I say culture, what do you think about then? Without reading this, when we say culture, a cultural event, what do you think about? Like what pops up in your head? If I invite you, do you want to go to a cultural event with me? What do you think then? Where are we going? No? The movie, yeah, or theater, the opera maybe. Mm -hmm. That's normally or often what we think of as, uh, as culture, right? And he's trying to explain this by the um, execution activity that is attractive with particularly high value. Art, music, literature, things like that. What we consider to be culture. And then we also have what we call the popular culture. And sport may be a part of this popular culture, rather than fine culture. Maybe some types of sport can be fine culture as well. Can it? I'm thinking. <laughs> Are there any sports that we can also cross the border to being fine culture? Chess? No? Maybe not? No. No. And then you can also look at culture as a way of life. Kulturell livsverden, we say in Norwegian. And there, sport is definitely a part of this type of culture. Movement culture. So when we say in Norway we have sport, it's actually in Norway sport is financed through the cultural department or a culture department, yeah. It's not department in English. Culture department. Is that a department? Yeah, yeah the, the official, <laughs> like, official department of culture. So sport is per defini definition in Norway culture. Uh, so there's always a, a, this, a dispute about whether or not sport is culture or also if uh, these uh, defenders of fine culture would obviously argue that sport might not be as fine and hence shouldn't be <coughs> termed culture. But why is sport so popular? We've been talking about that before. Uh, I think maybe the first lecture. What is it with sport? And what is it with sport that is so uh, special in certain contexts? Because now we're looking at a global perspective. Okay, we know why we do sports, it's fun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But why is sports popular in other cultures too? We're not going to sit down and, and do this as a group or anything, but we may start here. Some sports are characterized to be national sports or national pastimes, as they are called in America. How many such national sports can you think of? Give me a national sport of the United States. American football, or maybe baseball. baseball. Baseball, yeah. Other other countries, sports, Germany, football, football. France, football. <laughs> hmm. Are there other sports that are the popular? Rugby. Rugby in France, yeah. Rugby. Yeah, football, and rugby. Norway. Cross country. Cross country skiing, and maybe football too. Yeah. I don't know. Finland. Ice hockey. <laughs> yeah. Ice hockey. Canada. Ice hockey. South Africa. Rugby. Australia. Cricket. Cricket. Good, so you know. Japan. Sushi. <laughs> Su sushi? <laughs> Almost sushi. Sumo. <laughs> yeah. So, different sports, or different countries, different sports, obviously. Football is probably, at least increasingly so, the one sport that more countries 
uh, look upon as its national sport, although it's not uh, developed in that setting, such as baseball is developed in America and they have that as their national pastime. And then, is there a way that a national or nationality or national culture is being exposed through sports? Are there, yeah, you're, some of you are footballers, right? Is there a German way of playing football? There was maybe something that was called, uh, what was called like German football with a lot of work and not, not hard work. Not technical and things like that. Yeah. Exactly. Right now it changed a bit. It's changing? Yeah. Becoming more, more technical. a global sport maybe? It, it, it always was a global yeah. sport. Other countries that have their own ways of playing football? Spain. Spain? What characterizes the Spanish way of football? Mm, technical. Technical? A lot of passes. Passes? Yeah, or Italy, really defensive. Defensive? You know where we used to have a, a specific football style that everybody hated? in the 90s in particular. What did the Norway do? Long passes up the field. <laughs> Long passes to this tall guy in a forward position. Drillo football. football. Didn't have to be, in Drillo's terms, it didn't have to be elegant. Why should we, why should we pass the ball so we would lose it? It's better to have one long pass and score. Very defensive. But when they conquered the ball, it was actually quite effective. Norway was quite high, actually, on the international ranking. Were, weren't they second for a little while in the 90s? Beating Brazil, beating everyone. Everybody hated Norwegian football and Norwegian football style. They were ridiculed it, ridiculed it, it because it was so boring and very defensive. But the object was to win the game, wasn't it? That was a Norwegian-style football, but now we see that even in Norway, although I'm not, a foot, um, <laughs> I'm not trying to sound like an expert in football, because I really am not, but apparently <laughs> times are changing. So, and we see more and more teams, for instance, Molde under Solskjaer, playing a whole different type of football with uh, many passes, for instance. You see them even in training. Uh, it's very, um, this um, small spill, what's it called? <laughs> Um, yeah. fast passes, etc., many touches, which is a different way of playing football. <coughs> maybe, and now I'm just throwing it out, maybe football is becoming uh, more, even more of a global game because there are many transfers, there are many people changing clubs. Uh, many clubs, even in Norway, uh, consist of players from everywhere. So maybe there is an adaption to that. Maybe football is becoming less uh, national specific or... Uh, I'm going to show you... I can do that now, actually. A way uh, of... Um, there is this, this famous... Um, famous... Um, well not famous. <laughs> He's a so he was. He's dead now. He's a sociologist uh, who used to work in Oslo. Is, he was Argentinian, Arcati is his name. He was studying, uh, he was studying um, Argentina and their national culture. He was also writing a lot about football and writing about the Argentinian football style, which was on its height under this guy. Who is it? <laughs> that didn't help. <laughs> it was just <laughs> Maradona, of course. Uh, and he was sort of the incarnation or, or, the, the ident or how to identify the Argentinian football. He was um, uh, a technical wonder, uh, very good with the ball. He was still, they would say he was very elegant, a very, a very elegant player. Maybe how they, who other, what kind of other players are Argentinian? M Messi? A little bit the same characteristics, effective, 
elegant. He's not very big, he's quite small actually, but he still had this attitude of the Argentinian football, they would say. Argent uh, Argentina, like the rest of um, the world, <laughs> got foot pro football from England. Or uh, immigrants coming to Argentina, um, bringing football with them. Football was developed in England, and the early traces of football, the early way of playing football, was obviously then very British. And the British people, when they were playing football, although football became, um, soon became a, like a working sport, working class sport, it was developed in the upper class, right? Remember? Yeah? You remember that sport was developed in the boarding schools? And uh, the way of playing football in England was different from what it was played in, in, um, in Argentina. Football in England, or the British style football, and also which developed, was more of a, not hit and run, but pass and run. It was um, mechanic, they would say. It was um, uh, not, not boring, but it was very... Um, yeah, me mechanic, ener energetic, energetic, was that what you said? Yeah, working hard, almost like German, you say, <laughs> German football, working hard, passing the ball, do your job, bam, 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 technical or, or um, like a machinery. And then come a different way of playing football. And this can also probably be studied in Brazil or any other nation that is similar. Arquetti says that Argentina the Argentinian culture um, is, uh, or is a, what they call a hybridization. Do you understand that word? Hybrid. Hybrid? We know that. We kind of got bikes that are hybrid, now, so that's probably why we know the, the name. But that's a mixture of many things. The Creole culture, which is uh, characterizing this area, is a mixture of everything. Many immigrants coming around the same time, bringing different cultural expressions. Many Germans in Argentina, for instance, um, they came a bit later, but the <laughs> I remember, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but uh, even though there are many other European countries that were, or Spanish, that are in, uh, in Argentina. So it's a mixture of, um, of many cultures. And that also affects the way people are, they would say, the ones that are studying this. They, are, they, are, they, they have all these different things and it doesn't fit in the way, for instance, the British people are playing football or were playing football. They needed to adapt the different culture to who they were. So he would say they, that they made I don't speak Spanish. Does any one of you speak Spanish? Criollo. You do? Criollo? What does that mean? Maybe it's adapted from the Creole. Yeah, probably. <laughs> from the Creole, Creoles. So it's a, they, they call it the Criollo style of playing football. It's very passionate. It's, um, it's, uh, it's uh, improvising. It represents freedom like the Creole culture. Do you have a definition? No? No. So, um, so this is, is kind of visible in the way they're playing football and the way they are. Of course, we can't say that because people are uptight and like this or because we are very, uh, very defensive in Norway, we need to play boring football. <coughs> but it's, uh, th it might be an expression of something that is uh, going through your sports, um, the way you practice sport. In Argentina, they have the same, uh, the horseback. Polo is probably the second, at least were, the second uh, biggest sport in Argentina. And they have the same uh, way of, of playing polo. And of course, tango, which is a very passionate dance, um, which is also a part of that, uh, that style. So, the, as he says, or argues, this whole way of playing football or playing sports is characterized by who you are. But maybe 
And that's a hypothesis, a hypothesis, because I haven't really got anything to back that evidence now. But maybe this whole globalization of sport or people moving is doing something with the way that we play. Especially sports like football, which is actually, people are actually coming to play football. I don't know if the globalization of sport affects handball, if there's only Norwegian and Danish people playing handball, so maybe. Okay. So what is globalization? What is it? What does these, um, what does these commercials have in common? Yeah, are they American? Yeah, or the brands are American. The brands are American? Oh, that's actually, um, yeah, it's a good, <laughs> uh, what do you say, observation. It's not intentional, actually, because globalization doesn't only have to be from America. Be can also Americanization. That's right. <laughs> and that's why I shouldn't only have uh, American brands. But that's a criticism to globalization. It's true. But it's a good illustration of anywhere in the world, really. Uh, They're drinking Coca-Cola, eating McDonald's. They are, we're smoking the same cigarettes. Or they are, no, not we, of course. <laughs> They're smoking the same cigarettes. And, um, and the world is becoming smaller. Not only when it comes to brands, we're moving more. How many of us have traveled uh, the world? Probably all of us have been around. Uh, our my grandmother, she, she hadn't been flying a plane until she was maybe 87 or something. Then we went to Stavanger, she was terrified. <laughs> but but it's, um, it's just a whole different way of moving. The world, oh yeah, and we have two international students in our class. That's great, but it's part of the globalization, which is also very important in our university sector. You should all go <laughs> abroad. <laughs> <laughs> but still, this is a, a part of the world right now. This illustration may show what globalization is. This guy's going out there at the, uh, somewhere. They're going at the airport. Please call us. Don't forget to email me or text message me. He has an iPod. That's probably so 1999. <laughs> but still, Korean cap, the American movie, going everywhere. So we are a blend. All of you have computers. They're not made in Norway. It's part of something else. You're drinking Coca-Cola and Powerade. We have coffee cups. Where are they made? Snooze from Sweden, etc., etc. We're living in a globalized world. Basically, um, uh, the mission. And some people are attempting to define globalization, but it's not very easy. As I said, it's a dis disputed word and it's difficult to, to, or it's poorly defined. It's difficult to find a definition of something which is still going on. And maybe it's not even important to find a definition of it. Maybe it's not critics of globalization or the word globalization will argue we can just stop using that word and stop, start using something else. It's passé, we're post that. Um, but unless, now instead of defining it like 100%, we may say that this is a process where it's an exchange of cultural expressions, exchange of uh, not only culture, but it's ex exchange of political, financial, social expressions. Um, it's a way we are becoming more similar in a sense, but still, sport is characterized by big divisions. Although we are very similar in sports, we're not necessarily that. We, okay, we play the same game, but we play as opponents. So although we're together, there's a very clear division. 
in sports and why is it relevant for sports? Well, we all know how sports spread across the world. So the patterns of spreading sports is a part of globalization. It's still going on. And also, maybe even more importantly, and maybe even for, or for you uh, studying sports management or sports studies, um, sports being part of a global economy as a very, very strong factor of sports, the financial or global economy of sport uh, is a driving force. More so maybe than sports codes is this uh, economy around it. Also, when it comes to migration of players that they talked about earlier. Um, and the sports economy, we, didn't, we talked about that I think the first time, but the sport economy is a very, very strong, this whole uh, buying, selling players, is a very, very strong um, and riding uh, force in the world, in uh, financial terms. In this book that you read, or you have on your reading list, uh, they're talking about uh, levels of globalization when it comes to sport. And you can divide it in four, political, economic, cultural and social globalization. For those of you who were at the lecture yesterday, political globalization, that might have to something to do with the domination and the power of some international sports organizations, such as the IOC. How powerful is the IOC in the Olympic system? You remember? It's the most powerful uh, Yeah. They're more or less governing the whole yeah. Olympic system and the system of sport, may, maybe even, because they're deciding which sports should be part of the Olympics. Yeah. Um, and then they govern the international sports and the international sports organizations. So this whole, uh, and also we know uh, both steady evidences <laughs> of FIFA, for instance, how powerful they are, uh, and how disputed that is, of course. But those organizations, they are, are more or less uh, deciding what's happening in the world of sports today, together with uh, the media. But there's a very, very um, strong connection there. And when we talk about then, when we talk about political globalization, it will be those organizations that set the term of what the world does, basically. What is important in this world of sport. Economic globalization, we already talked about the spread of or, or uh, occurrence of, uh, of trading products, both human and uh, sports goods which is becoming a very, very big industry and also just spreads all over. Cultural globalization. We will talk about that in the next 45 minutes or the last 45 minutes. Uh, that is when cultural expression, such as sport, because we can define sport as culture, or we, at least we do it, is being transferred and, uh, and shared between nations and people. And we of course know that sports has been spread all over, has been culturally globalized. It has been part of that process long before we started to call it globalization. Uh, but it, it's, that's kind of in the same, uh, what do you say, bracket <laughs> as, uh, as the spreading of sports. And then, since we know that this has exis existed for 200 years, or at least 150 years, it might not be accurate to call it globalization even. And then we have the social globalization, immigrants, migrants, and social welfare also contributing on the sports market. Um, might be part of the economic globalization, but also the social globalization. We are getting to know other people from other countries through our, our sports. My volleyball team in Oslo, we had people from America and Canada and Germany and 
Poland. So it's a it's a it's also a, slow, a social kind of thing. Um, and sports is definitely on each of these arenas, more or less. So it's um, and um, it's um, is a what do you say? It's a state of state of the world that is just <coughs> it has been, it is, and it still will continue to be globalized. So if you use the word globalization, global sports or not, it's still this process that we are we are um, yeah fl flowing across borders or whatever. But um, It wouldn't be fun to talk about or analyze unless there were some criticals here. And we will see in the next slide that there are uh, people talking about this in a positive way, as we can find in anything, uh, as you also did. But there are also problems with globalization. Uh, we talked about, and you already covered, the global work market. It's increasingly the world is your, what do you say, the world is your oyster <laughs> and your stage. You can basically go wherever in sports, if you have the means, of course. Not always you do, but if you do. So we have a great migration of players across borders. But not always does everyone have this chance. And there also, as we, t we already talked about, there are very, very, very large gray areas where this is actually a problem. Uh, it creates uh, successful athletes. Successful in terms of what? Of course, not everybody will be Ronaldo. But going to Europe and, for instance, Europe or, or somewhere else, and being able to, to live a decent life, that is also a success story. Just play on a random uh, third division team in, in, um, in, in, the, in, the, in Holland and being able to have a little bit money that is also a success story I would say because the high, the biggest leagues <laughs> are not uh, are not for everyone of course but the consequences are the ones that doesn't make it at all that either are being um, in the hands of of um, uh, corrupt agents or people that are supposed to take care of you Many of these guys, because that's a problem, for instance, with African players, many of these guys are maybe 12, 13, 14. And they're taking from their families and the family said, no, no, he can't go to, to Europe. Yeah, he's going to be a big, big star. Come on, you have to pay for his ticket. That's the only thing you have to do. And then you have to, who can pay for the, for the tickets? Well, maybe you have to sell, they have to sell their houses or if they have some wages or something they've... Um, like this film that I saw yesterday, their, his family. He was sent to Europe when he was 15. And his family, of course, had to pay the tickets and additional money to the agents. And um, they had to, uh, what do you say, ponte, ponsette, pon, pon, <laughs> the house. Uh, and everything they had, that they had collected, they were going to buy a, a piece of land or something, of course, they had to give everything to this agent because uh, their son was going to be a big star and down, further down the line he would of course uh, send them money home or send money home and he was quite good he, this guy he was quite decent he wasn't it wasn't the worst example or uh, uh, the most um, sad example maybe but he still first thing he did playing for a week and he got injured and um, his agent saw that, okay, nobody would be interested in him when he's injured. So he just put him away at this little hotel in Paris, where he was around three weeks or something without seeing his agent, 15 years old. And this story ended um, not very well, but not very bad either. He just didn't make it, but he made it back to Cameroon eventually. Um, so it was a, not a very sad story apart from the fact that his family didn't have any money and he didn't get any money, but still, he didn't die or anything. <laughs>
But still, this is just one of very, very many stories that are similar, as I already say. So, uh, so there are grey areas of this uh, global work market. Sporting goods industry. Who produces our uh, sporting goods? Do you have any running shoes? Look inside, where are they made? China. China? Bangladesh, maybe? Indonesia? <coughs> China? China is a big market now. China is a big in uh, or economy, but there is so many different uh, levels there, or at least. But who, where's the market? Basically of your sports, sporting goods. Is that in China? Asia? Africa? That's where the market is for Adidas shoes? Nike? In Western, in the so-called Western world, right? Industrialized world. So where, um, where does the money of this sporting goods where, who does it benefit? Because produc producing a pair of uh, sneakers is very cheap, but they're pretty expensive. So who earns on this sporting goods industry? Is it, uh, yeah, is it the people produ producing? The factories in China? The workers in Bangladesh? No. It's the people on this side that is buying and giving the money to the manufacturers or the people owning the, the brand. So this, the critics will say, this sporting goods industry has extreme differences and the gap between this and that side is huge. So although we're talking about a globalized sporting industry, it's only globalized in the terms uh, that they if we can call it, they are working for us. So, I will show you that in the next slide. This is also considered a big problem when it comes to globalized, the globalized sporting world. Who sets the terms? It's easy for us to be critical to the Olympic movement as being like this patriarchal organization that is um, that is um, deciding everything in sport and is so powerful. But we are also very powerful as consumers. And we are creating, we are sustaining this gap in the, uh, in the global sport industry. By continuing, of course, we, should, we have to have shoes. <laughs> but we're continuing to sustain this gap, or maybe even make it bigger, between the ones that are actually profiting and the ones that are not. But it's difficult for us to know how, how we should do something with that. There was this, uh, just as a parallel, there was this... Did anyone, you see, uh, did anyone see this documentary in Norwegian TV, so obviously not all, <laughs> about uh, the food um, grocery stores uh, just uh, three weeks ago? How there are, in Norway, there are four, three, actually now, three groups that is controlling the whole grocery market in Norway. And they are deciding who should be on each shelf in the stores. So unless you pay a little bit to be displayed on the bottom shelf, on the right side, we don't want your goods. So for little industry, or little um, uh, bedrifte, bedrifte companies, small companies, it's almost impossible to be sold in these big grocery stores because there are three families or three groups that controls everything. And that's a big problem. But we have, and that's just in Norway. That's why we have high prices in our grocery stores and very limited uh, choices because we should just buy one type of chocolate, maybe two. But um, but it's, it's a big problem in our little national perspective, but it's also transferable to 
the sporting goods industry, for instance. Because uh, there are some market powers that are so strong. And we better just, if we should be part of this world, <laughs> we need to adapt to it. And then we have the global media sport complex. It's a guy called uh, Maguire, a researcher that has been um, uh, writing a lot about this. And that is also about <coughs> how media <coughs> is controlling uh, together with um, these big organizations, for instance, uh, the leagues, what, what we are exposed to, what we see. Of course, now you have, or we have internet as well, so we have a lot bigger opportunity or many more opportunities to be exposed to sports. If we want to see American sports in Norway, we can just go online. It's not that many years ago you couldn't see that in Norway because where, unless you had cable or satellite or whatever. But, uh, but the media sport complex, it's, it's um, characterized by, uh, by um, big actors, more or less deciding what we should be exposed to. That is also part of this globalization. So what we're interested in and what we're exposed to and what we know something about is often controlled by somebody who wants us to know something about that. And then, of course, commercial interests are paying for this. And then we end up being or seeing or doing the same things because we're exposed to the same things. I said uh, that there are criticals and there are supporters of this um, globalization idea or a global sports idea. And supporters uh, can be found in structural functionalism. We will say that it's necessary in order for the world to be as balanced as possible, in order for us to have harmony in and between cultures, we should be cultural homogene. homogeneity. Or cultural homogeneity is the, um, the ideal. Meaning that we all do the same. We all play football. Or we all at least not play football, we at least know something about football. To be cultural homo homogene. Uh, and that is good. Because then we can speak the common language of sport. Yeah? You've heard that term. Sport is good because it's a common international language. We don't have to speak. We can just kick the ball or we can just pass the ball. Whatever. It's good. Motorization theories, which were very popular in the 60s and 70s, they say that the world is more or less going from primitive and to modern and increasingly so. We're not, we're probably here somewhere, Western societies, but we will continue to be more modernized. So the only way is up. And then we have societies that are less modern. They might be here. Uh, or they might be here. We call them primitive societies because they're not as modern as we are. And then, we, since we are here, we obviously know what it takes to, to, to become he, us or to end up here or hopefully even higher. So instead of this culture going through all these phases, we can just tell them how to reach our face fast as possible. That is a very short explanation of modernization. Looking at the world in stages, one, two, three, four, five stages from primitive or traditional to modern. Western society is the key and we assume that everybody wants to reach the Western society in terms of modernization or in terms of standard. This is of course problematic uh, and it's also a very old <laughs> theory but we still think that way more or less. 
when we speak about us and them, don't we? We speak about us and them. They're not us. It's not everyone that is as modern, modern as us, is it? No? So we still have this idea of modernization thinking in our heads. And this idea that we are at the top here, Western societies, and um, that everybody obviously wants to be like us. And we can help them, of course. So modernization theory will say that globalization is a good thing or an unnecessary thing. Um, because uh, that develops societies. We can develop a society to become like us or more modernized if sport is globalized. And then we have conflict theories. And conflict theories are, of course, uh, <coughs> occupied with uh, looking at the differences in the world. And this is conflict. This is conflicting interests. And also a very popular theory that rose around the same time as modernization theory is what they call dependency theory, a world system theory. You will learn about this next year when you study uh, sociology or social anthropology. Uh, and world system or dependency theories will tell you that there is a division in the world. How do we write that? The center and around the center is the periphery. Who do you think is in the center? In the world, in the center of the world. It's more or less the same people as who are here, isn't it? So in the center you find the powerful the Western powerful people. And in the periphery, you find the least, what they called, used to call at least, because it's a bit unpolitically correct, but to, you find the ones that they thought were the least developed countries. And everybody, of course, desired to be a part of the center. But this where is where the definition uh, was, and this is where the power was. Um, so if you look at the world in a center periphery um, state of mind, it kind of uh, legitimates the fact that in the center that's where uh, every decision should be made. It's still this thinking of us and them, isn't it? Us and them. And it's problematic because the power will be here and then if we're talking about exploitation for instance it will be these people that are exposed, exposed to exploitation and also in terms of helping as we talked about earlier we talk about helping them to become like us in sports that can be as easy as giving somebody a football shoe or shoes, hopefully, unless they have only one leg. They give them football shoes so they should be able to play football. And that's a noble thought, isn't it? It was very popular in the 90s in Norway, sending football shoes to Africa. Used football shoes, of course, that we didn't want anymore. But, uh, but uh, it was a good, good thought. Many people do that still. But then critics would say that, what are we doing? Because creating or, or giving somebody a pair of football shoes is very good. But this person, these are already worn out, by the way. So they don't last that long. And this person that gets these shoes uh, will probably appreciate playing football with them. But what then do we do when the football shoes are worn out? And you don't have shoes anymore. You have to go back to playing without shoes then you created a need for football shoes, which is not ne really necessary. You don't need football shoes to play football, especially when you used to not to. And then you would say you create a dependency on something. And that's a very 
small <laughs> and very, uh, uh, what do you say? Yeah, a small and, and um, a specific example of a much bigger tendency that uh, we might find uh, when it comes to globalization to make people dependent on you, on your help or your assistance or whatever. We'll talk about the next later. And we, want, we don't have to do this. I will give you a break. And then when we come back, um, we, will talk, we will look at a specific case study uh, of a sporting, uh, of globalization of sport, we might say.